Hey everybody, just a short message about this episode. Um, in the last two editions of my Inspire and Activate Greatness newsletter, I've been highlighting some of the amazing progress being made uh, to help paralyzed people walk and lead higher quality lives. And writing about this, writing about these stories has me thinking about an episode I did with Sam Schmidt. Sam is an Indy race car driver and team owner who was paralyzed in an accident in 2000. And originally, this was episode number 128, but I'm re-releasing it today because Sam's life, life's mission is to conquer paralysis, which is also the name of his foundation. And since it seems to be happening, I thought you'd get some inspiration uh, from hearing his story again. So I hope you enjoy. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Uh, as you heard in the introduction, I've got Sam Schmidt with me today. Sam, thanks for joining me. Great to be here. Uh, I do owe uh, Teresa Eastler a debt of gratitude for connecting Sam and I. She uh, was on the podcast earlier. Hopefully you listened to that episode and I knew um, I knew Teresa from Strategic Coach, where she was my business coach for um, a number of years. And after she did the show, she was kind enough to introduce me to um, both to Sam and to a, a, another fellow named David Allen. And got a chance to talk with Sam maybe a month ago or so and uh, talked to him about the show and he agreed to come on. I'm just thrilled to have him. So, Sam, I start every show with the same question, and that is, how did it happen for you? Well, I guess I uh, I hit a wall at 210, and the wall didn't move. Okay. That happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, uh, I guess, you know, I could go back to uh, uh, to when my to when my parents left the church when they were married because my mom had to drive away from the church because my dad's license was revoked for for street racing. So uh, okay. my my destiny was laid before I was even born. Were born and started coming up. Um, let's I assume your dad may have gotten his license back by then. How did you how did you first get introduced to to racing and how did you I guess how did you figure out that that's what was what you wanted to do? Yeah, I mean I think it's a pretty common thing in motorsports that you know if your dad and your parents are into it you sort of evolve into it, you know, it's clear with the Andretti's and the Unser's and those, those legacy names. But I think it's the same for a lot of people. On the other side of it, a lot of kids get involved in baseball, basketball, and football the sure. same way. But uh, my dad raced before I was born, drag racing, super modifieds in the Midwest. And uh, he was known really well as a prolific uh, welder and fabricator. And so uh, this is the 60s. Um, a guy in California named Don Brown was known for really, really, you know, a builder of sprint cars, et cetera. So, uh, legends would buy sprint cars from him. He got a big order and called my dad and said, Hey man, I don't know how many of these cars finished. I need you to get to California. Well, I was to load up the 55 Chevy, you know, leave Nebraska, go to California and you're never going to go back. Right. So, uh, my dad started racing in Southern California when I was five, I didn't get a bicycle for Christmas. I got a motorcycle and, uh, and that was our life. We worked, you know, after school, I'd come home and, you know, work on my stuff. He'd work on his stuff. And every weekend we'd be racing, whether it was me at the motocross track or him at the super modified track. And, and I, I really didn't know anything different. I didn't think that was odd growing up. Right. Uh, fantastic way to build a family. And we were so tight and, uh, uh, you know, I, little did I know later in my life that that would be so important uh, to my recovery was the family and the attitude and the support uh, because it, 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 it does situation like this affects your whole family. And, and uh, if it wasn't for, you know, our faith and our community and our, our family, I don't think I'd be here today. And when, so let's talk about that a little bit, Sam, the, the, you, you know, the, the, the impact of something like what happened to you, you know, really touches your whole family. How has, how, and yeah, faith, 
faith I faith I understand and you need faith to get through something like this but I'm just curious how the what your what was going on before you before this happened to you and I guess afterwards um, there had to be I'm thinking there had to be a point where you're like oh my gosh this is it's never going to be the same and some parts are never going to be the same but how did you and your family rally around what needed to be done to keep making progress as opposed to reflecting on what could have been if you know yeah. before something happened well, i mean from a from a very young age uh you know racing the motocross my dad raced off-road in mexico uh, my hero was rick mears uh rick was from bakersfield california uh racing the desert then got hooked up with Roger Penske race super V's and, you know, from Bakersfield, California winds up winning four Indy 500s. So like, you know, my target was set at a young age that I wanted to get to the Indy 500 and I wanted to race the Indy 500. Ultimately I wanted to win the Indy 500. So, you know, laser focus on that throughout high school. Um, there wasn't any opportunities. So I did go off and get my MBA in international finance because your, your family either at, to do this, that's what's different about soccer. Your family either has to have a pot of money or you've got to find other people to support this. And so my family didn't have a pot of money. So I got a degree and started chasing the money myself and found people to sponsor my, my racing. Now it took me longer to get there and I didn't start racing until, you know, on asphalt until I was uh, gosh, 22, 23 years old, which is really late but that's how long it took me to get the money. And so, uh, you know, we, we, but we did make it. Long story short, fast forward, raced the Indy 500, 97, 98, 99. Uh, was very fast, fastest rookie in 97, 99, 98, 99 qualified sixth and seventh, you know, and led the race in 99. So a lot of success there. 99 was my best year where I finished fifth in the championship, sat on pole, won the Vegas race, which is kind of my adopted hometown. Right. And then it's like, you know, here we are living in this uh, euphoria of, of, you know, had reached my goals with, uh, you know, uh, racing at that level, uh, beautiful wife, seven years at a time, six month old, two and a half year old. And this is everything I wanted. Right. Um, but four months later, you hit the wall. <laughs> Reality check uh, was knocked unconscious and not breathing for five minutes airlifted to uh, Orlando uh, Regional Medical Center. And uh, my dad was there with me because it was a, a testing crash um, that they were uh, having an open test. My wife had to grab the six month old, take a red eye back. And so now we're, we're kind of caught up to the question, right? And uh, yeah. um, my doctor, just, my, my wife just got off flying all, all night and neurosurgeons aren't exactly known for their bedside manner. And uh, this guy was right, right up there with it. When the first thing he says is, Hey, the good news is you made it through the night. Uh, if he makes it through the week, uh, you're going to want to find him a nursing home. He'll be on a ventilator for the rest of his life, which we would expect to be three to five years. This is, this is how he greets your wife. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. What he didn't realize is that, when I was 11, my dad had an accident uh, down in Mexico. Uh, his brain slapped up against his skull, which paralyzed his right side and lost his speech, much like a stroke. And uh, our family went through that. And uh, his doctor said he would never walk or talk again. But that's when I found out at a very young age, if you want my father to do something, tell him he can't. <laughs> and he he did two years of gut wrenching outpatient therapy five days a week two hours a day i went to some of the sessions and and had a hard time handling it myself visually so i didn't go to didn't do that very often but anyway long story short he got his walking back uh got his speech back uh the only thing he never got back was the use of his right arm but he got back into business buried himself in that and continued to work until he was 65 years old and then basically retired. And uh, now he's 76 and still doing fine, right? So when I got hurt, that doctor didn't realize that that was our background. That was my 
goalpost, so to speak. Uh, he didn't know the, the driving determination that we had as a family. So they started calling and all the spinal cord injury centers around the country. I was out of it. I don't remember at all the first couple of weeks. Um, but they were calling, calling. Everybody said, you know, he's on a ventilator. We'll teach you how to live with it, but don't, don't expect to get off the ventilator. But there was one doctor in St. Louis that said, if you get him here, we're going to work his butt off. We're going to do our best to get him off, off the ventilator and uh, very aggressive forms of physical therapy. And we'll just do our best. And that's what everybody wanted to hear. And he was the only guy to do it. And it's Dr. John McDonald. Uh, the only guy out there really gave us any sense of hope. And so two weeks after my accident, they had me on one of those medical, medical airplanes and they were sending me to St. Louis. And, uh, you know, kind of the rest is history, as they say. Uh, that guy got me off the ventilator three weeks later and I started my intensive rehabilitation that I still uh, continue to this day. So I want to go, I want to get back to the ventilator in a second, Sam, but I, yeah. you said something um, when you were talking about getting your MBA that, you know, as a driver, you either have to have a pot of money. And I, I wanted to go back to that because I, I don't have a great understanding of what the race world is like, but I do, um, but, but I, I have heard enough stories about how, you know, drivers, they basically have to pay their own way. I mean, they have to figure out a way to get somebody to sponsor them. And it's a very, very difficult road. So could you just tell me a little bit more about how difficult that road is and how a drive, what a driver has to do to get a ride to become I mean, successful? It was a lot less expensive then, but I don't know that it's entirely different than, you know, say professional golf or tennis nowadays, because if you're a kid and you want to, you know, be one of those things, uh, you have to specialize from a very young age. You typically have to go to an academy in Florida, live there full time, yeah. you know, that whole thing. And that, that can't be inexpensive. But, you know, in our world, a kid wants to start in go-karts, kind of six, seven, eight years old at the latest. That is going to run the parent, you know, between 100 and 150,000 a year uh, to compete at that level. Uh, now, if the kid's really good out of the box, he could get factory backing for the go-kart or for the engines or something and not, not have to put up that full 150 grand. But you, you, it's kind of like the, the chicken and the egg. You got to spend something to at least find out if the kid's any good. And then hopefully he gets picked up with some sponsorships of equipment or whatever. But in no way, shape or form is a kid at eight years old getting paid. So a parent typically has to come up with that 100, 150 grand from six, seven, eight until 15. And then if you're fortunate, you're going to move up to oh, sort of F4 or F2000, they call it. And you're fortunate to only have to come up with 300,000 then. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and then if you do well, the next level is 550,000 at Indy Pro. And then Indy Lights is a million. And that's kind of you know, like your, uh, your AAA, AA, single A, or uh, it's kind of like um, Little League or Pop Warner. Then there's high school, then there's college. But it's not free. It, it, it definitely costs. Now, there are instances where kids have just been so shockingly good at a certain level that they'll get funding to move up through those levels. But, man, that's like one in a thousand. So you got to ultimately start the process with about a eight million to just do that and get to Indy Lights and have the opportunity to be seen, so to speak. So, um, yeah, that's it. Uh, and we didn't have that. My dad, my dad had an automotive recycling facility, which is most people know as a junkyard, um, you know, sold used parts most of his life and worked his tail off, you know, and paid for his own racing doing that. But that was just Mexico and, you know, he might spend 25, 30,000 a year on his own racing, not hundreds of thousands of dollars. So um, my first year in IndyCar, I was lucky. I only had to raise about $850,000 and I had the Indy 500. So 
that was easier than some kid in go-karts trying to, you know, trying to do 150,000 with, with nothing to, to show anybody. And so how do you, I'll just use you as an example. How do you raise $850,000 to get to, to be, you know, so that you can race at Indy? How, do, how, do, how does one go about that? Just relationships. I mean, it's, uh, it's another form of marketing. You know, you acknowledge you're, you're competing against billboards and front row tickets to the Laker game and all of these other things that companies spend money on. And to me, sports, kind of that motor sports, that behind the scenes, at the track, behind the pit wall, you know, being really engaged with the team and whatnot is, uh, is something that, you know, we've had success selling on the activation side. Um, because you compare that to a suite at a Laker game, for example, your customers come in, you got about 20 minutes before the game, have a drink, they sit down, watch the game, in the fourth quarter they leave, how much time have you actually had with them? You know, not much. Yeah, right. uh, and that's also, and that's also typically, you can only do that in LA. Well, we have a road show and it's like a traveling circus. And so what I'm selling is the ability for you and your customers to have two days of, you know, just nonstop activity. We build platforms from like come in on Saturday morning, play a round of golf at Beverly Hills Country Club, go over to Jay Little's garage, have dinner somewhere with the drivers, uh, get a two-seater ride in an IndyCar two-seater around the track, and then you watch the race and you go home. I mean, it's really, you know, 48 hours of relationship building, you with your customer. And, you know, that might be a couple thousand dollars, but that's no more than you pay for court-sided Lakers games. So, right. Uh, right. You know, we're not selling a decal in a car. We're selling an experience. Gotcha. Something that and I learned. Yeah. I learned that at a very young age, and we all co also connect the dots. You know, on B two B introductions and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I guess at a very early age, I put my put my MBA to work and uh, and try to be different than everybody else. And again, you know, now I got to raise seven, eight million a car. Back then, I, I raised less than a million. So it's all relative. Um, you know, just got to figure out a different way to do it. Okay. And <clears throat> I want to come back to that, too. So now I'm going to circle back to the ventilator and Dr. McDonald. What, yeah. what had to go on both, both mentally and, and phys physically for you to get off of the ventilator, Sam? Because if all these experts were saying you know, that's just going to be a part of your life or whatever's left of it. And he's saying, well, your own mind saying, well, don't tell me what's, what's going to happen to me. But then Dr. McDonald's saying, you know what, I think I can get you off of this ventilator. Yeah. I mean, that's a, a medical process they go to and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but you, you've got this ventilator in your throat and uh, they have different levels of filters. And so they just start kind of going day by day of blocking off that ventilator and you trying on your own to, to energize your, your diaphragm and train yourself to be able to breathe without it to where after hopefully a week or 10 days, they've got the thing fully closed off and you're breathing on your own. And hopefully, you know, when they pull that thing out, you, st you continue to breathe on your own. And um, I mean, I'll never forget. I, like I said, the first couple of weeks I was out of it on the move from uh, from Florida to uh, St. Louis, it was a really, really bumpy ride in a very small jet. And uh, I remember being tossed around quite a bit and the ventilator hose popping off and me kind of like blacking out because I couldn't breathe. And, you know, there's a whole lot of, there's probably a chapter in a book just in that flight from, from Florida to, uh, to St. Louis. But then you get to St. Louis and uh, the doctor that was assigned to me, the neurosurgeon assigned to me by Dr. McDonald, happened to be the neurosurgeon for the Rams. Well, he takes a look at my MRI and says, well, this is all wrong. We got to redo the apparatus in your neck. And that happened to be uh, February 2000 when the Rams were in the Super Bowl. And uh, Dr. McDonald said, we'll fix it fix it now because I want to get him 
into physical therapy as soon as possible. The guy's like, well, I'm leaving for the Super Bowl. He says, not until you fix this. So I went, I was there less than 24 hours and uh, went into surgery in St. Louis uh, to restabilize my neck uh, because they had put metal, metal in my neck to stabilize. I, I had no more um, C4 vertebrae that was just gone. So they had a bridge between C3 and C5. Okay. And, uh, and he, he didn't like the way it was done, didn't think it was stable enough. And, and Dr. McDonald didn't want to wait a week. So I got operated on that night. And then they just kind of became, I don't know, I was probably out of it another two, three days. And then he, he kind of began the process to, uh, to wean me off the ventilator. And that was, I got off it effectively uh, about uh, seven weeks after my accident. And, and how long was it before you were able to leave the hospital and start, um, you know, the process of living your life the way that you have to live it now? Yeah, it was a, a total of about six months. I uh, I went home in uh, end of June of uh, 2000, and the accident was January 6th. And, uh, of course, I went to, you know, from Florida to St. Louis, but uh, so roughly five and a half months in St. Louis. But I, I mean, I tell you, the time that I was on the ventilator was nothing short of a living hell uh, from temperature spikes to breathing issues to, uh, you know, just not being able to do the physical therapy because of the ventilator. And I, to, I can tell you without any doubt that if I had to stay on a ventilator, I would not be here 20 years later because mm -hmm. it was just literally day in and day out of living hell of, uh, you know, everything from suction to, you know, just all kinds of things. And so very painful, very just demoralizing and uh, uh, didn't have energy for anything, lost like 40 pounds. And so when they pulled the ventilator out, it was really like flipping on a switch. And I, I just immediately felt better and uh, didn't have any of those issues I had previously. And I, I just had no idea it was gonna have that kind of effect on me, but we went straight into the intensive rehabilitation and started doing, you know, literally uh, five and six hours a day, uh, physical therapy for five, five months, um, trying to get, you know, just bone, bone density and muscle mass and atrophy, just trying to keep all that stuff away. Um, so I was kind of glad I wasn't in St. I was in St. Louis away from my friends and everybody else because I could focus on it. Now, again, back to having, you know, good insurance and a family and a community that supported me. I mean, I also realized that I wasn't, I was in the minority there, you know. Um, my family was able to load up the Forerunner and drive to St. Louis and get an apartment. And they were there in the morning and they were there at dinner for me. And so I got to see him every day. Most families can't do that, right? And uh, I definitely realized that I, I have a leg up in that area. And if I, if I remember correctly what I read, you know, with you, so you're quadriplegic, you, you, you're off the ventilator now, you're going through physical therapy, you begin to become introduced to other people who um, maybe have it work, have it, you know, in your in your mind, have it worse than you, and so that starts to, um, that, that's kind of a, it, it's a hard thing for someone to imagine, who isn't, you know, isn't um, suffering with what you're suffering with. But you had, you saw this, and that really gave you strength, right? I mean, the, yeah, I mean that's that's ultimately what started the foundation back then yeah. for conquer paralysis now, because it was a specialized spinal cord injury. Uh, wing of a hospital with 20 beds and then there was 20 beds for brain injury and you see people coming and going all the time and it's well like you know what happened to Tony he was only here a couple of weeks well Tony didn't have insurance or Tony didn't have enough insurance or mm -hmm. you know whatever and I'm like that really sucks and then I'm getting bags of mail every day from you know fans and supporters people in the motorsports community and and I got my parents and my my wife and kids around me all the time. And these people don't have anything. You know, I mean, they literally don't have a pot to piss in. It's like, man, this is really wrong that, you know, 65% of the people 
that have a, a brain injury or spinal cord injury or ALS or whatever. I mean, they're all living below the poverty level. And uh, so that's why we started the foundation. We didn't know what we were going to do with it. But I, I had so many people offering to help. And I didn't want that to go to waste. Uh, but I did have my family insurance, everything else. So I didn't really need the help. But all these other people did. And so it was emotional and motivational help for me. Yes. But, you know, if you guys want to give money, let's let's establish a foundation and figure out the best way to use it. And so you established the foundation shortly after, right? like in the, yeah. within the first year. And I, as, I, as I read, I mean, the goal was really to um, figure out a way to um, reverse paralysis, I guess. And so the 20 years, 20 years in, where are you with the foundation? How has the progress been? And, and then what, what's, what specifically have you actually gone through on your own to um, like I'm thinking stem cells or I'm thinking all these different things that are available recently, at least. Can you, can you, can you talk to me about that? Yeah. I mean, first off, uh, it's definitely been a process, no different than any for-profit company would go through in that. First of all, I'm sitting there in the bed thinking about my previous 30 years and up to that point, there had been never been never been a goal that I couldn't achieve just through pure drive and determination. I mean, literally, whether it be racing related or college related or business related or Indy 500, I set that goal and I just went for it and I figured it out one way or the other. And spinal cord injury was really the first thing that it's like, holy crap, this is not easy. People have been working on this for a long time and every spinal cord injury is different. You know, uh, the way the body takes that damage to the spinal cord. I mean, I've seen people with ugly looking spinal cords that are walking and I've seen some with good looking spinal cords that can't get out of bed. So what's the difference? And it didn't take me long. I mean, like at first it was hell, you know, we should be able to solve this just, you know, money and time and we can fix it. And then when I dug into it, it was like, there are so many complicating factors. And uh, it's not just spinal cord injury, it's transverse myelitis, uh, ALS, uh, MS, Parkinson's. I mean, these are all nerve related disorders which sort of broaden the marketplace, so to speak. But I realized that, yeah, I mean, when you think cure, you think stand up and walk is what everybody thinks. But the reality is, you know, my definition has changed over time to where I just like to hug my kids. You know, for me, that would be a cure. Um, other people, it is walking. Other people, it's, you know, being able to get out of bed. So the, the foundations evolved over the years. We've invested, I think it was close to $8 million specifically in this spinal cord injury research realm of stem cells, rehabilitation techniques. Um, and I, I basically have seen a lot of rot, a lot of rats walk. I'm sick of seeing rats walk. And now we want to see some humans walk. And really it's just uh, probably in the last five years that it's starting to pay off. I mean, we have our own, uh, first it was a driver in a sprint car in Iowa who uh, we put into our techniques and in intensive rehabilitation, and he's now walking with a walker. My own driver, 2018, hit the catch fence at 220 in Pocono, um, had a spinal cord injury. They said he never walk or talk again, but through intensive rehabilitation, uh, he's walking with a walker, and that's uh, Robert Wickens uh, from Toronto. And now there's like you know 140,000 people watching his progress. So, you know, social media can do a lot there. But at the end of the day, um, you know, there's millions and millions of people living with this disorder um, around the world. And so uh, the latest evolution of our foundation, uh, A, is constantly searching for human clinical trials that we can invest in for everything from, you know, bowel and bladder control to pain, ma to pain management, 
to rehabilitation techniques. And then the other side of it is uh, we just kind of got pissed off at what wasn't available out there for the intensive rehabilitation and the fact that insurance companies don't cover it, that we opened our own neuro recovery center in uh, downtown Las Vegas. And, you know, back to our previous conversation, uh, I was in rehabilitation with good insurance for six months. Now, 20 years later, I'd be lucky to get two months with excellent insurance. And most people get a month. And that's not enough. Uh, your, your house isn't ready. You don't have a van. Your family's not ready. And they send you home and say, you're on your own. So uh, our big you know, initiative and advocacy and everything we're trying to do with, with a lot of the foundation now is just making sure insurance companies know that, you know, you pay me now or pay me later. If you send me home now without the proper level of independence and rehabilitation, um, I'm going to be back in, in six months with a $125,000 pressure sore or some other disorder that you're going to have to pay for. So you're better off to spend a little more money now with proper intensive rehabilitation and make me more independent so that I don't have to come back to the hospital. So this, this is the battle we're fighting. Um, but, you know, I really enjoy it because again, I know that I just had a lot of advantages in my situation that other people don't have. And the foundation is a conduit for us to try and address that as much as possible. And you mentioned a couple of examples of, of folks um, well, back from your dad and now more recently, the, the, you know, your team driver and some others. What, is, what has been the most optimistic thing you've seen in progress since you started the foundation? What's been, you talked about some of the challenges, what's been the most optimistic thing? Well, generally speaking, you know, when it happened to me 20 years ago, any spinal cord injury was like almost a death sentence. Uh, you're not gonna, there's no chance you're gonna recover. There's no chance you're gonna get back any, any use of your limbs or anything like that. And so, you know, over the last 20 years through media, social media, other stories, people do know that if they work hard, they can ga gain a different level of independence. And if they work hard enough, they may get it back. You know, um, the fact is if you lay there, and do nothing in the hospital, you're not going to get anything back. Sure. But if you work your butt off, the sky's a limit because I've seen plenty of people walk out of the hospital. They were told they wouldn't just, just through, you know, pure determination. Um, but I mean, I still, you know, I mean, I worked my tail off for 10 to 15 years and yeah, I still can't move my arms, but I travel 140 days a year and mm -hmm. 40 flights and, and so I finally, I think, eight or 10 years ago, came up to the realization that uh, at least without stem cells or, or other type of maybe brain interface technology, I'm probably not going to get my arms back. But there's a reason for that, because I find myself talking to a lot of people that are better off than me, i.e. paraplegics and lower level quads and people that can breathe on their own, et cetera. And it's very easy for me to say to them, what the hell's wrong with you? Why don't you do something with your life? I mean, you know, unless you're, off of, unless you're on a ventilator, you're not any worse off than me. So why don't you be a productive member of society and support your family, put bread on the table, instead of being a drain on society? Um, I, I genuinely think that's probably the reason that I haven't, you know, got a lot back is that, you know, I can roll into the hospital room and be pretty blunt with people, you know, mm -hmm. some people like it, some people don't like it, but you know, what have I got to lose? Right. Well, not only that, but what do they have to gain by seeing what, what you're doing? Yeah. And, right. Yeah. I mean, there's not a week, not a week that goes by that somebody doesn't either, you know, send an email or call me or, or uh, I see them at the, at the gym and they're like, man, I mean, you, you know, you motivated me to, to get on with my life and uh, figure out what my passion is and, and just live the dream. You know, I mean, it sucks, but you know, if you're a paraplegic, you're, you're a hell of a lot better than me. And, uh, and you got a lot more 
uh, ability to do to do a lot of things, you know. So, yeah, yeah I don't take any excuses. So you mentioned um, earlier Jay Leno's garage as being maybe part of the experience, and I have um, had the pleasure of watching you and Jay Leno um, drive a car. And in fact, as I understand it, Sam, you um, you have your driver's license now for an autonomous autonomous car. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but let's. I don't. I think it's called the Sam car. I'm not sure, but can you? It's it's pretty. So you can drive. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, Sam is a is actually an engineering acronym engineering acronym for uh, semi autonomous mobility. Okay. That was come up by Aero Electronics. It isn't. It isn't because of my name. That was just a uh, serendipitous situation. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, we've been on that project for about six, six and a half years, and it was pretty rude at first. Our goal was to just drive around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway at 100 miles an hour, and Aero Electronics and their team of engineers out of Denver, um, you know, came up with a concept and a process, and they accomplished that tax in about eight months, which was truly unbelievable. And I thought that would be the end of it, but they said they wanted to do more and what do I want to do? And I said, let's go faster, you know? So the next year we came back 100, 150 and third year we came back and raced Mario on the road course, which was a lifelong dream and uh, mm. bucket, bucket list item. And then we raced up Pikes Peak, which everybody thought was insane and it probably was. But uh, then I got my driver's license in 2000. 17 and went 192 in the car so far and um we just keep checking the box i mean doing fun stuff and uh promoting you know i mean it it really was a bit of a wake-up call for me because it is uh, you know if you have the right resources and the right people put them in a room and say accomplish this task get it done they, they can get it done and uh you know i never thought i'd drive again but uh you know, but Aero Electronics made that possible. And for a guy like me, that's, it's almost as good as walking. Well, I was thinking as you were talking about that, you're, you know, 100 miles an hour, 192 miles an hour. Obviously, you, you were a professional driver. So you've got the, the, the mindset about what that is and what that feels like. And most of us don't don't have that. But you were able so they made they made they basically combined your brain with their vehicle in order to accomplish this. Am I, is that is that about about right? And how so? How do you first of all were you scared when you got back in the car and we're going 100 miles an hour? I guess that's first question. But then after that, I'm just thinking to myself, um, how how does it actually work? How do you control it? Because uh, I, I think it's super cool. Well, that's why Arrow did it in the first place is to is to show the world what they're capable of. And their kind of niche, their niche in the electronics industry is taking off the shelf technology that has been around for a while, you know, tried and proven, and, uh, and reconfigure it in ways that haven't been used before. So we use infrared cameras. We use, uh, you know, just uh, sort of interface actuators and technology. And it all, it all happens in real time. Like I can, from the time I move my head, to the time the car turns is, is really, I can't tell, I can't tell the difference, right? It's all, it's all negligible and immediately. And so it all, I mean, again, this has evolved over seven years from several different forms of equipment and receivers. And at first we had to have the, the car completely blacked out for light. Now we, now we take off the sunroof and roll the windows down and mm -hmm. the, the sunlight, it doesn't matter how bright it is. So they just continued to refine the technology. But ultimately it's cameras, cameras looking at my head. I've got on sunglasses with little embedded um, tracking devices so that when I turn my head to the left, cameras get a signal, send it to the computer, computer sends it to the steering wheel, car turns, but all instantaneously. I mean, like, you know, I, I can't tell the time lag at all. Um, turn to the left, turn to the right. Um, and then in my mouth, I have a straw like this, which is effectively a sip and puff from a wheelchair. So I blow in that, it goes, I suck, it stops. And, you know, 
It's progressive. I blow hard. I'm going to light up the rear tires. I just kind of whisper. Uh, it just leaves like a, you know, normally pushing on the gas and same with the brake. So it's all proportionate. It's all programmable. So when I drove up Pikes Peak, I had really tight turning radius. When I went 192, I, you know, they were able to dummy up the steering so that it wouldn't go anywhere but straight, you know, so okay. driving, driving 190 was easier than driving at Pikes Peak uh, by a fair bit, you know, so um, again, I've got this just wonderful, wonderful team at Aero, and uh, it's kind of evolved, different engineers, different years, and some kind of come and go, you know, within the company internally, but uh, um, amazing, amazing opportunity, and we just took, uh, took delivery of the new mid-engine C8 Corvette, and uh, I'll be driving that in about a week uh, with new, with even new technology on it. So uh, they keep pushing the envelope, but I'm happy to, you know, push it with them as uh, as long as they'll have me. And when do they think this will be something that's available to to other people like you? So they're so you're sort of the you're the test pilot, I guess, right? And um, I'm the crash test dummy, yes. Oh, but, uh, for, okay. But so far, but, <laughs> but so far, I haven't, I haven't been that dummy. But uh, knock on wood, no. I, I think there's a couple, couple different ways to look at this. Uh, this is where, where we're heading is a merge of this technology, but also autonomous driving coming from the other way. I think uh, mm -hmm. the ultimate scenario is where. You know, I can just lock down in my car. And uh, because right now, the scariest time that I'm driving that car is on the street because I know what I'm doing, but nobody around me knows what I'm doing. So um, ultimately, if I can have the comfort of my car not allowing me to run into anybody or run a red light or hit a pedestrian or any of that stuff, that would be the best, uh, you know, sort of in a semi-autonomous takeover format. And so we all know that's coming our way from an autonomous driver standpoint. Right. Sure. And then going the other way from a control system, whereas like I would need voice activation to start the car, put it in reverse, uh, adjust my mirrors, that kind of stuff, which we have. So there's that application on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think more importantly is using these kind of controls for industrial purposes to put people with disabilities back to work. Uh -huh. I think that's more important uh, to drive forklifts or to drive har harvesters or to control anything using your mind, um, which is not that far away, is more important because let's face it, you know, with, like when it comes to disabled veterans, right? Um, a lot of times they signed up just to put bread on the table. They go over there, they get their legs shot off or whatever, and uh, spinal cord injury or amputee, and they come back and, and you know, their livelihood's taken away. Uh, they're encouraged to stay home and do nothing. They don't get any vocational training. And it's like, well, why did I do that? There's no support for the battle they're fighting. And I really would like this type of control system, you know, to be offered as a way for these young men and women to get back to work or do whatever they want to do in life, you know? Right. And so uh, I think that's really where we're headed with the project is an effort to show how we can take that burden off of society. I mean, if we could take a thousand, you know, sort of disabled veterans and take them off of, uh, you know, sort of Medicare's payroll, and put them on their own payroll at 80 grand a year driving a truck or whatever, yeah. that would be so much better for everybody. They'll have a, have a reason to get up every morning, you know? Um, and that other ugly statistic of 20 veterans a day committing suicide, I mean, yeah. it's just, for, that's ridiculous. That shouldn't be a real situation in America, period. So that's the kind of bigger picture stuff that Arrow's going after. They have a, they have a DOD, uh, division and an automotive division and they're working you know sort of all those angles um, and uh, 
just trying to push the envelope. So a little small world connection here. One of my friends here in Wisconsin um, was the president of a division at Arrow in his previous uh, his previous um, job. Yes. Um, so yeah, so I, I I know a little bit about a little bit about Arrow, but um, yeah, of, everybody everybody's like who the hell is Arrow? They a new company? Well, no, they're an eighty five year old you know company that started in Long Island selling yeah. transistors for TVs, and now it's a thirty billion dollar tech company you know, based in Denver. So they're in 50 something countries, 18,000 employees. And, uh, and this has really been, you know, eye opening, you know, for their employees, for their engineers. Um, it's been a, a way to, to make everybody a bit cohesive here. And um, I've just been, I'm just been blessed to be part of the ride, you know, and, and show what technology can do for people with disabilities. If you just think about Siri and Alexa for, you know, for, you know, oh, people yeah. with pe able-bodied people love it. And it's kind of like a neat little thing to be able to turn on the lights. But, you know, for somebody like me, that can be life-changing to be able to do that stuff. Yeah, so sure. thank, you know, thank God we're all kind of moving in the same direction. Well, if you, um, if anybody goes to YouTube and they look for Sam's videos, I, I, I've watched at least two of you with the car, and I would say that if you watch those videos, you would not think that it's very far off for some of those other applications that you were talking about to be real. Absolutely, yeah. There's there's about 15 there. We we do a lot of different things for different people, and uh, uh, some of them are sort of promo promotional nature, but a lot of them are, you know, whether it's Pikes Peak or there are different technologies deployed. And it's been an amazing, just the unanticipated benefits of doing that project. And a lot of engineers that were thinking about doing other things are now focused on this type of stuff. So um, I think it just had a lot more impact than, than anybody originally thought it would. And that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad you made the connection with the other types of applications because I hadn't when I was, yeah. I was, I was thinking driving, but you're right. There's, if you can, Anything that you can drive, you could drive with this technology, I suppose, or any, or any a lot of other things with this technology, you know, just, yeah, operating a machine or whatever, you could do all kinds of yeah. things. The, the, the connectivity in the world today has evolved to where a farmer that gets disabled could drive his harvester from his living room, period. You know, yeah, sure. Using, using cameras, using control features, and, uh, little bit of geo mapping or GPS. Yeah. Um, you could just do it there by the computer screen. Pretty cool. So let so what foundation you also still have your business hat on and you become a, t a team owner. Now I wasn't I wasn't 100% sure if you had owned teams before the, the accident or you just got into that after it, Sam, but I, but obviously big time after it. Yeah, no, I was, I was, I was a driver uh, beforehand and uh, a paid driver was uh, at the time Sprint PCS, which is then Sprint, which is now T-Mobile, right? But, yeah, right uh, yeah. but that was my last season uh, before I got hurt. And then about a year after I got home, uh, my wife is like, you know, our entire relationship of seven years, I was on the road 200 days a year and now I'm home and there's PT people and nurses and people coming and going. And my wife's like, uh, you really need to find something to do or else this isn't going to work. You know, so, <laughs> you know, I, I thought about, you know, I, I had the degree and could have gotten into finance or could have gotten involved with a company, but you know, my passion was always racing. So, you know, why not try owning a team? And we started out in Indy lights, which is the uh, AAA, so to speak or the College of Racing, just before IndyCar, mm -hmm. one level down. And we were very fortunate in 11 years. We won 70, uh, sorry, seven championships and 80 races. And we were based affectionately called the, uh, the Roger Penske of Indy Lights, which I don't think there's any better, you know, any better thing to be called yeah. than the Roger Penske of Indy Lights. And, uh, you know, good or bad in 2011, uh, almost 10 years ago, I was given the opportunity to uh, to buy an existing IndyCar team, and it came with sponsorship and with with personnel and with 
with equipment and it was basically a free deal to get a trial run at it. And uh, I just kind of said, well, if we're successful, we'll stay in it. If we're not, we'll go back to Indy Lights. And unfortunately, that first year, we sat on the pole at Indy, sat on the pole at Texas, and had a really good run up, you know. So um, it's it's pretty consuming. I mean, it's 55 full-time employees now and, and uh, you know, pretty stressful budget at times and all that kind of stuff. But uh, it, it definitely, you know, feeds the need for the, the competition and the passion that I have for motorsports. And sometimes I wish it was only Andy lights because that was only 10 people and a lot less risk, you know, but, uh, but then you wouldn't be racing Indy 500. So right. it's, it's, you know, uh, but it, it, it's, it's a perfect, I think world now in that I can, you know, use my connect, my connections in IndyCar to help the foundation in a lot of ways. And then I'm also tied with a company called Broad Ability, where I'm a shareholder and on their board, and and they're the largest manufacturer of wheelchair lifts and uh, wheelchair accessible vehicles in the world. So um, it all is is interconnected. We can have, you know, date the races program where we try to motivate people to get back into what they're what they're passionate about. We can, uh, you know, help you know get the the Chevrolets and the Firestones of the world to help us with our foundation initiatives. So uh, it's a pretty good little triangle uh, from that respect. Sam, how did the the um, the drivers, either drivers on your team or, or the rest of the drivers or the driving community, how do they interact with you when it comes to you know what they're doing every day and what you are doing every day and you know kind of what what can happen? I'm just, you, you, well, that's my, uh, you said some really that's cool my about the, you know, when you're with other, you know, paraplegics and others, you know, how you would you basically get them to focus on what they can do and not what they can't do. But I'm just curious, especially, and, and then I'm thinking like what their parents say and, you know, want to know from you and that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, that's the part I love about the sport, but I don't get to do it as much as I'd like, you know, I mean. First and foremost, I got to find the money, or we or we don't do this, and that's what I I find myself spending a great great deal of time doing. I really enjoy interacting with the drivers. Uh, I remember it like it was yesterday, and and a lot of them are kind of shocked uh, because uh, you know, I am older now, and uh, uh, when I start talking to them about driving techniques and brake pressure and and trail braking and different things, it's like. Oh wow, you, you really did drive one of these things. I'm like, yeah, I did. And and I'm trying to help them not make the mistakes I made, right? And uh and the safety has advanced, you know, leaps and bounds um, you know, since I got hurt. So that's that's again a good thing. But uh, um that's probably what I like doing the most is interacting with the engineers, interacting with the drivers, spending time with the guys. I the rest of it is eh, not so much fun, but you know, you can't do one without the other. And when I talked to you earlier, when we were sort of just getting connected, you had mentioned, um, I think that Savannah is getting married. Is it this year or next year? Next year, um, she's got engaged about a month ago. So she's, yeah. you know, looking at dresses and looking at venues and trying to think, you know, can I have a real wedding? Or do I have to have a small one, you know? Uh, but hopefully, yeah, she's 23, graduated over a year ago and actually had a, a job lined up in London, but COVID kind of destroyed that, mm -hmm. unfortunately for her. But uh, but she's a smart girl and uh, she's gonna go, she's gonna, she's gonna save the world, you know? Um, at a, at just very philanthropic and very giving and uh, probably uh, talking about going to law school in a year, just study international law so she's uh she's got a lot of a lot of big goals and what about your what about your son Sam? yeah i mean spencer he's he's amazing he's creative um does a lot of art is uh studying art at pepperdine and uh okay. he's a uh, he's a junior in college okay got it obviously uh obviously pretty smart 
if he's going to school in Malibu. Yeah. And he's had, has, has he raced? Has he been um, interested in racing or is he, it's just not his thing? Well, you know, we, uh, we never wanted to discourage them from doing anything they wanted to do. Sure. And uh, inevitably at around nine, 10, 11, they asked if, uh, if they could race go-karts and their grandparents didn't want that to happen. But uh, I said, yeah, sure. What the heck? Come on out. And I, you know, you know, right away, whether or not they've got the passion, um, you know, to do it. So we took them out to the track. I had a friend with a bunch of go-karts and I said, okay, you know, here's the deal for every hour you spend on the track, you got to spend a certain amount of time prepping the car. And, you know, if you're going to be committed, you're going to be working on the car every day, or you're going to be driving the car every day. And kind of like that Christmas gift that is great for three days. And then it kind of yeah. sits in the corner with both of them. It was kind of the same thing. And I'm glad that we didn't say no, you know, just like a hard no, but we gave them the opportunity. And at the end of the day, they weren't as committed as it takes to do it. I mean, you got to be all in as a family, as a, as a driver, uh, no different than those, you know, tennis stars and pro golfers. It's what they do every day. Yeah. When they get out of bed, they want to go drive. And uh, I knew, I kind of knew going in, my kids won't like that, but I think they had to discover it for themselves. And I was, this is my last question for you, Sam. Um, the, the, um, I'm thinking about video games and, you know, the, the way you drive the car now is sort of, yeah. sort of like a video game. The, 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 I feel like, video game technology is probably going to have an impact on, um, you know, paralysis, you know, just I'm probably going to, and then I'm thinking about driving, you know, the kids that come up now were raised on video games. Do you, do you think that drivers now are the ones that are committed? Are they better drivers because of, you know, that, that, uh, hand eye or whatever it is, um, where you didn't have that, I didn't have that when I was when I was growing up. Or do you think, nah, not really? It doesn't hurt. I mean, uh, driving is is such a combined discipline. I mean, most people doesn't think you have to be that physically uh, capable. But I tell you, um, you know, it's very, very busy, very physically demanding. And being successful at racing is probably seventy five percent mental. But if you can't handle it physically your mental side's going to slack off right mm -hmm. so uh the physical many many of the drivers in uh indycar are you know professional triathlete you know level athletes and mm -hmm. uh aerobic fitness and physical fitness and uh, certain muscles forearms necks that you have to focus on um but to your point i think uh you see a lot of especially in nascar right now new guys william byron and Ryan Blaney and uh, uh, gosh, number of them that said, you know, they spent 10 years driving simulators exclusively and, uh, and therefore the transition from the trucks to the Xfinity to the NASCAR was a lot easier because they had to add, had all that background on a simulator, but uh -huh. hand-eye coordination is very important. So the simulators can't hurt. That's for sure. Yeah. And maybe actually there's a connection between not, you know, abusing your body by working in a simulator, you yeah. know, because you because that physical part. Is that, oh, that's interesting. I never thought of that. And every every major race manufacturer, uh, Chevy, Honda, everybody, they've got these simulators, which are pretty elaborate. And uh, so nowadays, you actually do a lot of your a lot of your setup, a lot of your testing is done in a in a full on simulator okay. uh, as opposed to on the track. So you have less and less track time where you can drive on the racetrack and more and more time in a simulator. So all that stuff's important uh, to your point. They're developing, you know, brain interface technology where there's a computer on your brain that can tell the computer what you're thinking. And I think that'll have a lot to do with the disabled and, and what we do in the future. So it's, it's all on the table, so to speak uh, yeah. from a, uh, from an opportunity standpoint. Yeah, because I'm thinking, how far could it be till you have like an exoskeleton or something that you can control just the same way that you can control that car? Like, yep. Some, so. 
Well, uh, Sam, Sam Schmidt, thank you so much for being on the show and making time to do this. I, Not a problem. It's been a real pleasure. Um, you should check out Sam's videos on YouTube, um, his, his foundation, Conquer Paralysis Now, and of course, Arrow McLaren uh, IndyCar Racing as well. So, um, so glad that Teresa introduced us and, and that you made the time today, Sam. No problem. And uh, yeah, come out to the racetrack sometime and we'll show you what uh, real racing is. And for the fans out there, yeah, IndyCar, IndyCar is on its way up and we have some really, really exciting racing out there. And so we'd uh, appreciate the fans coming out and say hello. is brought to you by WinCheck Studios. We are an all-in-one educational platform for podcasters that revolutionizes how hosts leverage content to increase engagement with listeners, downloads, and income. We come together to focus on community, collaboration, and collective impact. For more information on how you can interact directly with our hosts, access exclusive live content with offers you can't get anywhere else from our official partners, join our purpose-driven community by visiting www.winject.com. If you're ready to build a career doing what you love, then we're ready to see you there.